Okay, great. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So uh, hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining another Outcomes for Me webinar. Today, we are delighted uh, to welcome Dr. Karen Smith. Uh, Dr. Karen Smith is medical oncologist specializing in breast cancer at Johns Hopkins, Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center. Dr. Smith's research focuses on young women with breast cancer and on reducing toxicities and managing symptoms during therapy for breast cancer. Dr. Smith is joining us today to discuss endocrine therapy in early stage breast cancer. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Maya Saeed. I am the co-founder and CEO of Outcomes for Me. At Outcomes for Me, our mission is to empower cancer patients with the tools and resources to better navigate their care. Through our mobile app and web platform, patients can have access to free resources and information, including treatment options and clinical trials to help manage their disease. The format of today's discussion will be Q&A with Dr. Smith. Uh, we've gotten a number of questions. Thank you all that submitted questions ahead of time from our users. And, but we also encourage those that are joining us live today on Zoom or on Facebook to submit your question via Zoom, the chat button, or Facebook Live. And we will do our best to get them answered during our time together. So before I get started with the questions, um, I want to start out, and, and I see some people are raising their hands. Just ask the question in the Q&A or the chat uh, button, and we'll, we'll get to them. I want to start off by allowing Dr. Smith to give a brief introduction about herself, and then we will jump into uh, the questions and the topic we want to cover today. Dr. Smith. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Karen Smith, and I'm really happy to be here. I'm thankful for the invitation. Uh, as Maya indicated, I'm a breast cancer medical oncologist. I'm an assistant professor of oncology at Johns Hopkins in the Women's Malignancies Program. And um, my clinical practice focuses specifically on the care of women with breast cancer. And I'm very, very interested in hormonal therapy, also called endocrine therapy, and in working uh, together with patients to make it as tolerable, tolerable as possible and to support patients in continuing to take the therapy to try to prevent recurrence. So I'm looking forward to answering your questions today. Great. So we've gotten a number of questions today that cover around four topics, and I'm going to take them in that order. So first we'll cover, you know, who this applies to and what we mean by endocrine therapy. Then we'll talk more about the effectiveness, the risk of, the, of endocrine therapy, the risk of late recurrence and duration of therapy. And then we want to talk about, there's a number of questions around the various treatment options, uh, where's, where the uh, treatments are going. And then finally, I'll end on side effects and adherence issues. We've gotten a lot of questions on that topic. So let's start with, uh, um, by understanding the patients to which this session is relevant to and the definition of endocrine therapy. So can you please tell us who this session is relevant to today? Sure, so um, this session is relevant to uh, people who have early stage breast cancer. That means not metastatic, meaning it has not spread to other parts of the body such as the bone or the lungs. Um, the vast majority of people who are diagnosed with breast cancer, up to 90% or even more, are diagnosed with early stage breast cancer, uh, which is curable. And our goal is to give you all the treatments necessary to achieve cure. Not only do we look, however, at the stage when we're thinking about who this session is relevant to, but also at the type of cancer. And this is particularly relevant to people who have hormone sensitive or hormone receptor positive breast cancer. About 75 or even a little bit more percent of early stage breast cancers are hormone receptor positive. And these are the people in whom we typically recommend hormonal or also called endocrine types of therapies. So this session really is relevant to the people who have early stage breast cancer that's hormone receptor positive. Great, thank you very much. And tell us, we about endocrine therapy, but maybe let's start by defining what is it? What is endocrine therapy? And to whom it applies, we covered a bit of it. And why is it prescribed uh, in early stage breast cancer? So um, endocrine therapy um, is sort of a, a catch-all phrase that refers to treatments that target uh, the hormones, the female hormones, and those are estrogen and progesterone. And um, the way that we figure out if a breast cancer is hormone receptor positive is that we look at the 
a tissue sample that we get either from a biopsy or from surgery. And there are things on there called the estrogen receptors and the progesterone receptors that we can test for. And if we see expression of those, it's typically measured as a percentage. So anything 1% uh, or higher is considered to be hormone receptor positive. Although the higher it is, the more hormone sensitive it is. So that's kind of the, the who and how we figure it out. There are different ways the medicines work, and I think you'll maybe ask me to describe the, the mechanisms um, in just a moment, but in general, a hormonal therapy or an endocrine therapy is one that basically blocks the effect of these hormones and thereby hopefully reduces the risk of cancer from returning. Great, thank you. Um, so throughout the Q&A, some questions are brought and sometimes we, we will present a, a specific patient cases. So I'll present to you one in this context. So consider this patient case, a patient with early stage one breast cancer treated with breast cancer server, uh, conserving surgery and radiation. Uh, what is the true benefit of endocrine therapy to this person and is it needed for everyone? So that's a great question. Let's kind of take it apart a little bit. So breast cancer is staged zero, one, two, three, and four. And the lower stages refer to smaller cancers that uh, may not have spread to the lymph glands and generally have a lower risk of recurrence following surgery. So a stage one cancer is typically a very low risk of recurrence. Breast conserving surgery means that this patient had a lumpectomy or part of the breast removed, the part that had the cancer. Um, after surgery, the reason that we consider endocrine or hormonal therapy is that even though the cancer has been removed, we are always worried about tiny cancer cells that may remain. They may either be in the breast or they may have traveled via the blood or lymph system to other parts of the body, and they may be too small to detect, but we certainly worry that over time, those cells could set up shop and grow and ultimately become metastatic breast cancer or breast cancer spread to the bones or the lungs or any other part of the body. The reason for the endocrine therapy is that we presume those cells are hormone sensitive just as the breast cancer was. And that by giving the endocrine therapy, we can in theory starve the cells and thereby we reduce the risk of the cancer returning and spreading. And we ultimately improve the chances that a woman will beat the cancer. Great, thank you very much. I want to go through another patient case that we just received on the chat uh, and I'm going to read it. So the person is triple negative and did not start the current therapy until after mastectomy. Uh, she had neoadjuvant taxol, herceptin and progetta and now on cadecla and letrozole. Uh, do you see a benefit to holding off on endocrine therapy or is it better to start immediately? I am 50 years old and have chemo induced menopause since June uh, of last year. Is it letrozole of, uh, a endocrine therapy? So maybe you can help us. Yeah. On this. So this is, a, a, this is a very complicated uh, case. Um, this is a case that is hormone receptor positive and also positive for another marker called HER2. Um, and in that case, we typically will give chemotherapy, Taxol plus HER2 targeted therapy before surgery. And then following surgery, depending on the results, we sometimes need additional HER2 therapies and that's the CADSILA. However, in the case of a hormone receptor positive breast cancer, um, following surgery and following completion of chemotherapy, that's generally the time that we initiate the endocrine therapies. Um, Endocrine therapy, as you may know, goes on for many, many years. So there's not a precise date that it's you know best to start, but in general, we would wanna get started pretty soon um, after the surgery and following the completion of chemotherapy. And the CADSILA therapy typically goes on for about a year or so. And it is generally recommended that the endocrine therapy be administered at the same time as that. And then once the CADSILA finishes, the endocrine therapy will continue. Great, thank you very much. So now I wanna move on to uh, the topic of effectiveness of these therapies, how effective they are and the risk of late recurrence and duration of treatment. So to get started, can you tell us how effective endocrine therapy is at preventing a recurrence? And maybe 
you know, one of the patients on our platform shared with us that she has been given several different answers to this question and is hoping you can share your experience on what you have seen in your practice. Uh, for this patient, just as an example, she has e seen answers that range from 1% to 50% reduction in breast cancer re recurrence rate, which I have to say, you know, that's pretty wide. So give us your yeah. perspective, Dr. Smith. Um, so uh, endocrine therapy definitely reduces the risk of recurrence and actually improves um, survival, makes women ultimately less likely to pass away from breast cancer. There, when we talk about the benefits from endocrine therapy, it can be difficult to measure because we are really talking about risk. Um, and everyone's, uh, there's two different kinds of risk. There's a relative risk and absolute risk. So I would say that in general, taking endocrine therapy almost halves or approximately halves the risk of a cancer from returning. Now, what that turns into in terms of absolute risk reduction depends on wh what the individual patient's risk was to start with. So for example, if you have a patient who has a very large tumor that has spread to the lymph glands and is quite aggressive and has a high chance of coming back, if you have that, that's a big difference between those two numbers. Let's say it went from 50% down to 25%. You get a 25% absolute benefit. But let's say that you have a patient on the other hand that had a very small breast cancer that was no negative and had a starting level risk of 5% and we have that, her risk goes down to two and a half percent and the difference is only two and a half percent. So that's how the numbers I think can kind of be a little bit confusing because you're looking at relative and absolute numbers. Great, thank you very much. Um... That's, and actually, let's talk a bit about the time, uh, you know, that we are on these therapies. You mentioned that we've, they've taken for a very long time. So, you know, one of the questions, we have actually a number of questions, some that were submitted before, some I see coming through the chat, just for people that just joined us. Uh, you can submit questions via the Zoom uh, chat or Q&A or on Facebook Live, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, so let, does taking endocrine therapy for 10 years, so it tends to be prescribed between five and 10 years. So the question is, does taking endocrine therapy for 10 years instead of five years significantly decrease a person's chance of recurrence? And you know, should women at higher risk for recurrence continue aromatase inhibitor after five years of treatment? And maybe just to add to that, which actually I think we just got also on the chat, uh, the, the opposite is, why don't you take it beyond 10 years Should, since uh, hormone sensitive breast cancer couldn't recur 15 to 20 years after treatment? So does it matter? So these, these are very, very complicated questions and the field is evolving, I think. Um, historically, uh, breast cancer endocrine therapy was given for five years and that's just kind of the way the studies were done many, many years ago. Um, but as you indicated, the risk of recurrence of hormone receptor positive breast cancer does persist for a very long time. And if you look out even 15 to 20 years after diagnosis, it's uh, pretty constant. It doesn't drop off. It's a relatively low risk each year, but it doesn't get lower after a certain time point. And that's different from the other subtypes of breast cancer, which have a higher risk of recurrence very soon after diagnosis but then the risk really does drop down. And so because of this longer term risk, people have started looking at longer durations of therapy. And there's definitely data for tamoxifen, uh, which is one of our hormonal therapies, um, demonstrating some added benefit for, for 10 years compared to five years. And then there is also data looking at, for women who started out with tamoxifen, if they wanna then do the second part, with an aromatase inhibitor that does demonstrate benefit. For the aromatase inhibitors, there have been several studies looking at just plain old doing 10 years of that type of medication. And the findings have been a little bit more mixed um, in terms of how much um, kind of added bang for the buck you get with extending the therapy. Um, I think in my practice, we always plan for at least five years. And I think that for women with higher risk disease, I encourage them to consider longer therapies. 
Um, but what also comes into play is how they're doing. And we're going to talk about some of the side effects, but um, quality of life and side effects and, and individual patient's preferences certainly come into that decision-making process. That's great. Um, let me ask a couple of questions that also we're getting through uh, the Q&A and the chat. Um, uh, so uh, actually this is very relevant given uh, the pandemic. So as you know, given the pandemic, many cancer patients started endocrine therapy before their surgery because of the pandemic and the surgeries were canceled or delayed. Typically, so the question is typically endocrine therapy starts after surgery. Is there any if impact because some of us started before surgery? Um, I don't, I don't think so. There are even are some cases where we start intentionally before surgery, but certainly things were challenging during the pandemic and many people couldn't get to the operating room, but I would just continue with the same plan and you kind of get credit for time served in terms of the number of months that you did before surgery. Um, and then you continue in the post-operative setting. Great. Um, the, we have a couple of patient cases on lobular um, car carcinoma. So I'll go through the first one. So consider this patient case. Patient was diagnosed with early stage invasive lobular carcinoma, no lymph node involvement, treated with mastectomy only, oncotype was eight. How beneficial is endocrine therapy? Um, so uh, there are two main types of breast cancer. There is invasive lobular and invasive ductal. Um, ductal is the more common one, uh, and lobular much less common. Um, and they both are generally, uh, more often than not, hormone receptor positive. There is um, a certain amount of data that suggests that lobular cancers may benefit less from chemotherapy, um, but no data indicating a difference in the extent of benefit from hormonal therapies. Um, and then there's some data suggesting that lobular cancers may particularly benefit from aromatase inhibitors over tamoxifen. Um, you mentioned a test called the Oncotype. That is um, a frequently ordered uh, genomic test that can be sent on tumor tissue, and it looks at 21 genes and kind of measures their level of expression and converts it into a score. And the score gives two main pieces of information. Um, the first piece of information it gives is an estimate of the risk of recurrence, assuming the patient with that score takes hormonal therapy. And the second piece of information it gives is an estimate of whether or not chemotherapy will be beneficial in further reducing the risk of recurrence. So I, I think the oncotype is informative in this case in that it tells us that it's low and there is unlikely to be a benefit from chemotherapy. But uh, to my mind, the oncotype is not useful in telling us the relative expected benefit from hormonal therapy. Um, it does assume uh, you know, that one is taking it. I think um, you know, overall, the vast majority of patients who have a hormone receptor positive breast cancer can benefit from hormonal therapy. There are very rare instances that we may choose to omit it. And that would you know, generally be in the case of very small, very low risk uh, cancers, uh, perhaps in elderly patients who have a limited life expectancy or many other health conditions that may uh, interfere with taking it or may make the potential expected benefits smaller. Great, thank you very much. Um, actually, I'm gonna cover another lobular question, but before I do, you, you, you explain to us what Oncotype was. We're getting a number of questions uh, on the another one, breast cancer index, uh, and the question whether that could help, uh, and is it you, uh, does, does it guide whether people should get on endocrine therapy or not? So there are a number of different um, commercially available uh, tests that can be done on uh, tumor tissue, and they can be used in various ways to help um, get prognostic information about the expected outcomes, and then uh, sometimes to gain information about the expected benefits from certain types of treatments. The um, BCI test, or breast cancer index test, um, is not a test that is useful in determining uh, whether or not to administer hormonal therapy, 
But the BCI test does give a certain amount of information about uh, whether or not the cancer is expected to have a later recurrence, uh, typically defined as years um, you know, beyond year five and years five through 10 following diagnosis, and then whether or not uh, continuing hormonal therapy beyond five years in that time frame may be beneficial. Uh, so some doctors may choose uh, to get that test to help guide that decision of whether or not to extend the therapy beyond five years. Uh, there are other uh, strategies that we can pursue in addition or instead of that test, but that is the definition of what the test is. Great. Thank you very much. How do we know once we start endocrine therapy, whether it's working? I mean, is there a way to measure whether it's working or not? I wish there was. <laughs> so... Endocrine therapy, um, you know, is given to patients in whom the cancer, in, in most instances, it's given to patients in whom the cancer has been removed in its entirety. And we are just treating with the concern that there might be tiny cancer cells that are too small currently to detect. So unfortunately, using current standard of care tools, the only way to know it is working is whether or not the cancer ultimately returns. Um, there's a lot of research going on right now looking at um, more uh, detailed blood tests and things like that that might be able to detect uh, minute amounts of cancer or cancer breakdown products in the blood that might give us a better sense of whether or not it's working and what the risk of recurrence while on therapy or over time is. But at the current time, there, that is not standard of care. It's um, being done on a research basis. And the only way to know is the passage of time, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanna also cover another love of breast cancer uh, question that we got uh, actually through the chat. Uh, the person, so consider this patient case, diagnosed with lobular breast cancer, lumpectomy, one, one centimeter, HER2 negative equivo equivocal, on letrozole, what happens when I have to go to, get off this medicine? Mine is 100% estrogen. Doesn't body always produce estrogen at some level? So I guess the question is why not stay on it? So I think that's a, a great question. Um, you can you tolerate know, it, I guess, yeah. Yeah, so as I said earlier, the original studies kind of looked at five years as this uh, awareness of the risk of late recurrence um, started to develop, we've looked more at 10 years, and there is even a little bit of data looking out to 15 years. Um, I think it becomes an issue of weighing the risks and the benefits of extended therapy. And the longer we continue, we may see more and more downsides in terms of the toxicities. Uh, the other thing that we know is that taking endocrine therapy has a carryover effect. So for example, if you take it for five years, we know we see benefit out to at least 10 years and probably longer. So I think the optimal duration is not truly known at this point, and it may be different in different people. And we're hoping that we will be able to be more individualized in the future as the field advances. But currently, uh, once a patient reaches the end of the planned course of therapy, be it five years or seven years or 10 years, the standard recommendation is to stop. And we don't know if it's harp, harmful if people continue. Um, I think it's more just an issue of you know added toxicities. For example, with an aromatase inhibitor, we have loss of bone density and things like that. And the longer we do that, the more problems that may occur. Okay, great. Um, so consider this patient case, and then we'll move to the other topic. Um, uh, her doctor has recommended 10 years of tamoxifen. Is there a possibility that this could be shortened to five or seven years if she continues to show no signs of recurrence? I guess we come back to the similar topic, but. Yeah, so um, five years is a standard therapy. So um, if a woman does not wish to pursue longer therapy, I think that that's not unreasonable, particularly if she has a low risk. Uh, there is some data looking at with the aromatase inhibitors that suggest that seven or so years may be equivalent to 10 years. Um, so, but that would be sort of extrapolating um, in terms of tamoxifen because the tamoxifen data is generally for five or for 10 years. But these are decisions that really need to be individualized. And, um, you know, 
uh, with a one-on-one -on -one discussion with your doctor about the side effects and your kind of individual expected benefit from continuing the therapy to see if it makes sense for you, to see if the added gains in terms of reducing the risk of recurrence outweigh the toxicities. And they, they may not for everybody. Okay, thank you. So now I want to move uh, to the topic of uh, 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 treatment options. So endocrine therapy is a class. It includes various treatment options. And I would like to take a few questions to help us understand the options and what's on the horizon, what's coming. Um, so let's start with, you know, there are various endocrine therapy drugs. Can you please help us understand the landscape, the different treatments, and how to choose between them? Sure. Uh, so there are two main classes. Um, there's a drug called tamoxifen, which is a um, estrogen receptor modulator. And then the other main class is aromatase inhibitors, and there are three of them. There's a nastrozole and letrozole and exemestine. Uh, in general, tamoxifen works both in pre- and post-menopausal women, uh, although it is used more frequently in premenopausal women. And the aromatase inhibitors work only in post-menopausal women, although they can be used in a younger woman in whom menopause has been induced. And menopause can be induced either by removing the ovaries surgically, rendering a woman postmenopausal, or by use of another type of a drug, which is called a GNRH or LH, uh, LHRH analog, which is an injectable medicine that induces medicine, uh, menopause via the medication without removing the ovaries. So those are kind of the main classes. Uh, the yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say the, the way that they work is a little bit different. So tamoxifen uh, goes to that estrogen receptor that we talked about that the cells are expressing and acts right there. The aromatase inhibitors block the body from making estrogen uh, at sites outside the ovaries. So in, it, as long as the ovaries are turned off or removed, it blocks estrogen production. Um, they're, they're by leading to less estrogen to stimulate the receptors. Great. And maybe that answers one of the questions we got on the chat, which is, you know, uh, consider this patient case, 32 at diagnosis, 5.4 uh, centimeter tumor, one positive lymph nodes. So that's radiologist told her she was stage 2A, uh, did not tolerate tamoxifen, uh, so did not take it for a year, had a total hysterectomy, and she started on the AI, but did not tolerate the aromatase inhibitor either. So her question is, I feel like having ovaries removed reduces risk. So is it really necessary to, to take the aromatase inhibitors? So maybe it goes back to how they work. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, inducing menopause uh, probably is one way to help uh, prevent breast cancer from returning. Uh, we do certainly know from young women who get chemotherapy and go into menopause because of that, um, or from data from some recent trials where menopause was induced in young women, that doing that does uh, contribute to reducing the risk of recurrence, but that really is not recommended as a sole therapy. It is recommended to do that plus uh, tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor. Great. Um, and so maybe talking about tamoxifen and the AI, so uh, do patients who take tamoxifen followed by an aromatase inhibitor or an aromatase inhibitor followed by tamoxifen see an added benefits relative to patients who take either one, aromatase inhibitor or the tamoxifen? So there's a lot of different ways to do it, as you are kind of indicated. And um, the choice, um, you know, in, in part is based on menopause status and is in part is based on uh, bone health and side effect preferences um, and things like that. In uh, postmenopausal women, I think that we could say that um, at least in the five-year plan, a regimen that includes an aromatase inhibitor, either the whole time or first or second, um, compared to tamoxifen alone does add some benefit. So um, including an aromatase inhibitor for a postmenopausal woman for at least part of the regimen is better than tamoxifen alone. 
Um, and for extending therapy, the women who uh, had tamoxifen only for the first five years certainly get benefit from adding the aromatase inhibitor um, at the end. So I, I don't think you necessarily have to use an aromatase inhibitor the whole time, but there clearly is some benefit for postmenopausal women. Yeah, and I have to say, because, uh, you know, the, uh, the Outcomes for Me platform integrates, as you know, the NCCN clinical guidelines, and the guidelines have evolved over the last couple of years, where now we see all these different combinations of the uh, sequencing of these endocrine therapies for exactly what you say. So um, we've been seeing them also so that, you know, as we integrate the guidelines. Um, what is what are the latest treatment advances? I mean, there's a lot of research ongoing in, in terms of, you know, endocrine therapies or other treatments and any new drugs on the horizon? So, yeah, I mean, this is a really exciting field. I think there's a lot going on. Um, I, I guess two of the new things that kind of jumped to my mind are uh, new hormonal drugs, and then the idea of combining some additional drugs with the hormonal drugs to further reduce the risk of recurrence. Um, in terms of new drugs, there is a new class that is being evaluated, uh, not yet approved or anything like that, but um, they're called the, the oral SIRs um, or uh, estrogen receptor degraders. So they are somewhat similar to tamoxifen in that they act at the level of the estrogen receptor, but they do it a little bit differently and they kind of break it down and make it be a bit more, a bit less effective. Um, and they're being evaluated in both women with metastatic breast cancer and in women with uh, earlier stage breast cancer over, over time. We expect to see a lot of studies uh, looking at that, um, which is really, really exciting. Um, and the other, great advance is um, uh, the CDK4-6 inhibitors. So this is a class of drugs that is very effective in um, metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer, and as a result has been evaluated in combination with hormonal therapy uh, in women with early stage breast cancer. And one of these drugs called abemacyclib has demonstrated benefit when it's given for the first couple years of hormonal therapy at the same time as the hormonal therapy. And the combination has further reduced the chances of the cancer from returning. Um, this is not something that everyone should do. It's uh, been limited to women with a particularly high risk. So larger uh, nodal involvement tumors that are kind of proliferating quickly. There are some pretty clear cr cut criteria uh, for uh, which patients are expected to benefit from this. And it definitely adds to the toxicity um, and the side effects. So it's something to kind of carefully consider with your doctor. It should not be absolutely given to everyone along with an endocrine therapy prescription. Thank you. And I do want to highlight that abemacyclib is Virginia. And the reason I want to highlight that, uh, actually, we got a question on the chat asking about that drug and when is appropriate for early stage breast cancer. So thank you very much. Okay. For <laughs> a question ahead of asking it. Um, and also, you know, the other thing I do want to emphasize, because that's something that, you know, at least for people that use the Outcomes for Me platform, know about is we constantly on the platform, this is why we, we not only provide personalized treatment options, but also uh, personalized clinical trial matching is so that people are aware not only of the newest approval in what specific, uh, when is it it's appropriate for what early stage breast cancer, but also, as you mentioned, the SIRDs, which are now being tested in clinical trials. So patients, if they're potentially interested to explore that, uh, have an opportunity to potentially enroll in, in a given clinical trial, correct? Yeah. Um, I think that these, trial, these trials are, are evolving, certainly. Yeah, great. Um, are there alternatives and or holistic options to tamoxifen, at least in the works? So besides surgical removal, so more, you know, maybe broader, or I don't know if nutrition-wise or any other aspects beyond the drug themselves? I mean, I think... I don't think that there is any uh, holistic or lifestyle uh, or alternative integrative intervention that can replace hormonal therapy for breast cancer, but I really do think that there are 
lots of benefits from doing these things. And there definitely is data that uh, working on healthy diet and being the right weight and exercise um, may have definite benefits. And a lot of these things are particularly helpful in terms of managing some of these side effects of the hormonal therapy. So that's another way to kind of think about using these other interventions um, in terms of allowing one to stay on their hormonal therapy. Great, thank you. Um, I want to now move to a patient case. So we're getting a lot of them actually, but uh, so I'm gonna try to get as many as I can, but feel free to submission. We, we can also follow up on them offline, but um, so consider this patient case. A patient has hormone positive, HER2 negative early stage breast cancer, and they just completed chemotherapy. Their doctor is now prescribing letrozole for five years. How do they know if letrozole is a better option for them than say tamoxifen or another aromatase inhibitor? Uh, so I'm presuming this is a postmenopausal patient because we're talking about an aromatase inhibitor without doing something to induce menopause. Um, as I said earlier, I think overall a regimen that does include an aromatase inhibitor um, has some benefits over tamoxifen alone, but there are three aromatase inhibitors. There is uh, letrozole and exemestane and anastrozole, and I think that the efficacy of these is uh, generally equivalent. Um, the side effect profile is also generally equivalent if you kind of look at it online or in the literature. Interestingly, though, there are differences in how individual women tolerate the different therapies. So, for example, if a woman tries letrozole and finds it challenging in terms of side effects and then switches to another one, such as anastrozole, about 40% of the time we find that the second one is better than the first in terms of their tolerance. So I definitely encourage you, if you're finding it hard to take the therapy, to talk to your doctor about what you can do to decrease the side effects, and then also about whether there is an option to switch to another drug. Great, thank you. Another question uh, that we got from a patient, can you take calcium deglucarate in addition to, or rather than taking an ar aromatase inhibitor? So I think that uh, what you might be referring to is the fact that the aromatase inhibitors can have a detrimental effect on bone density. So they can cause thinning of the bones. And as a result of that, we will often monitor bone density and we typically will recommend that women take appropriate uh, calcium that they get some from their diet and take an appropriate amount of supplement, uh, supplemental calcium, not too much, and then also vitamin D. Um, this does not replace the hormonal therapy, however, and I don't know of any data that would indicate that taking the calcium and the vitamin D would impact the risk of the breast cancer from returning. Okay. Uh, and are there ways, so another question we got, are there ways to identify DNA methylation markers predictive for estrogen to determine the rate one's body processes and eliminates estrogen? So there are not any tests that I'm aware of uh, that we use to look at the, the rate that a woman processes and eliminates uh, estrogen. Um, there are very few tests, to be totally honest, that we get uh, in women who are receiving uh, hormonal therapies. Occasionally, we do monitor estrogen levels, um, but that's really largely when we need to try to assess menopause status. Um, there is evolving research looking at markers for resistance to endocrine therapies, but getting these tests is not a standard of care uh, at this point. Um, and there is a test that looks at an, an enzyme called CYP2D6 that uh, there, uh, is related to the activation of tamoxifen, but getting this test is actually not recommended um, in terms of using it to decide whether or not tamoxifen would be helpful to you. So there really aren't tests that we get. I wish there were good tests that would be helpful, but there aren't any. Okay. Last question on this before I move to side effects, because we're getting a lot of questions on side effects. Um, uh, through the chat. So after finishing endocrine therapy, studies show we get risk-reducing benefits still. Is the estrogen level kept lower than it would be? Um, so you're talking about, I think, this carryover effect that you take endocrine therapy for five years, maybe, and then you see benefit up to 10 or even longer years. Um, I don't think that 
we, we don't typically measure estrogen, so we don't know, but I can't necessarily think of a reason why the estrogen level would be uh, lower than it would be otherwise um, during those additional years. Great. So in the last 15 minutes, I want to spend time uh, the remaining time on side effects and adherence issues. A lot of questions on the chat, a lot of questions submitted before. Um, so let's start there. What's your recommendation on the best way to manage side effects of endocrine therapy? There are many of them like hot flashes, fatigue, joint pain, vaginal dryness. So um, I'm not sure that there is one best way. Um, as you said, there can be a range of side effects and um, different people experience different side effects. Some people have absolutely no side effects and some people have multiple side effects. And you just listed some of the particularly common ones that we see. Um, there are, I think what most doctors and myself included will do is uh, get started on the treatment and see what side effects occur. And then we know which ones that we kind of need to target. And there is a range of evidence-based proven uh, mitigation measures for most of the side effects. And some of the interventions involve taking another medicine, but many of them actually don't. Uh, for hot flashes, for example, a lot of really simple things like using a fan or sleeping in breathable fabrics is really, really helpful. Uh, some women get benefit from things like acupuncture or cutting down on alcohol. So there's a lot of lifestyle things that you can do. And then there are medications. Uh, some of the antidepressants or anti-seizure medications actually have benefit um, in terms of reducing hot flashes, um, among others. So there's a, a whole range. And I think I would recommend, you know, talk to your doctor and about the specific symptoms and what you've already tried and what things you're interested in trying. Um, so that would be for hot flashes. In terms of fatigue, Honestly, the very best thing is exercise. We do not generally recommend uh, stimulants, but exercise uh, is the way to go. Um, I think it's also really important in a woman who's experiencing fatigue after breast cancer or during endocrine therapy to stand back and talk to your doctor about why you might be experiencing fatigue. It might be the endocrine therapy. It might be leftover side effects from chemotherapy or surgery or radiation. It might be that you're having hot flashes that are keeping you up. And if we treat your hot flashes, your energy would get better. It might be something else. And so it requires a, a pretty thorough evaluation um, before really embarking on any intervention. Um, for joint pain, actually similarly, exercise is uh, really, really effective um, and probably the best intervention that we have. And then finally, I think you mentioned vaginal dryness, Maya, and that's a particularly common one. Um, and it can be very bothersome for some women and it can certainly interfere for some women uh, with sexual activity or cause discomfort with vaginal intercourse. Um, generally, we recommend starting with non-hormonal interventions such as a vaginal moisturizer or a lubricant. And there are a number of other uh, products that can be used. Um, and in some cases, a woman may want to talk to her doctor about the pros and cons of using a very low dose of vaginal estrogen. Uh, there are some concerns about systemic absorption, so there are some, some potential downsides, but I think a careful discussion about the risks and the benefits of doing so um, is appropriate. And then also going to see a gynecologist, you know, make sure that you have a gynecologist on your team, not just a medical oncologist. Thank you. And I mean, there's a lot of symptoms and people experience different symptoms on different, um, you know, at different times. As a doctor, when you see a patient and essentially they're telling you about their symptoms so that you can help them manage their symptoms, what's the best thing as a doctor to just, uh, to help you understand the symptoms? And the reason I ask is, uh, you know, we've talked to a lot of people that, you know, sometimes people forget, uh, some people use, you know, the trackers we have on the platform, uh, and just interested because, you know, obviously that conversation with the doctor is so important to personalize the care. What for you is an ideal presentation of, you know, you haven't seen the patient in a while and they're coming and they're telling you I'm experiencing these symptoms, what would you like to see or know to help you help them manage the symptoms? So um, you're touching on a topic that is dear to my heart, which is, um, you know, um, 
how, how to optimize our communication with, with patients, both um, at the time of clinic visits and maybe even when they are at home. Um, because most of endocrine therapy, as you well know, is administered as an outpatient and we don't necessarily see you all that often. Um, I think tracking your symptoms uh, is great. And we're doing a lot of research on looking at whether or not um, completing some brief questionnaires uh, on your symptoms and reporting back so that we know kind of how you're doing, even though you're not uh, near to us is helpful. But I mostly listen to people. Um, in my experience, um, you know, pretty quickly during the first few minutes of every encounter with, with each of my patients, I find out what symptoms are really bothering her the most. Um, and I usually also run through my little checklist if someone hasn't mentioned something just to make sure that I'm not missing anything. But um, I think if you can keep track, um, you know, and kind of summarize for me, it's particularly helpful because it's hard to remember. Okay, great. Um, and that's kind of also, I mean, I, I just want to take an opportunity to uh, also thank everybody that have been using our platform and giving us feedback because the tracker, the symptom tracker came from actually a few patients telling us exactly that, that they needed that for the conversation with their uh, provider. So managing side effects, some people, as you know, also uh, stop the therapy. So what are your thoughts on decreased doses of endocrine therapy, including tamoxifen due to side effects? Are they still beneficial or the, uh, on the decreased dose? So stopping the therapy or not taking the therapy as prescribed, like taking it every other day or something, you know, other than the way it's written is a really big problem. I would say that, you know, up to almost half of women with breast cancer don't take it right. They either stop early or they don't take it regularly. And unfortunately, um, we have data that tells us that women who don't take it as prescribed unfortunately uh, do worse in terms of the breast cancer. There's a higher chance of the cancer returning and a lower chance of overall beating the breast cancer. So it's a really important problem for us to address. Um, there is, there's no data that I'm aware of um, looking at lowering the dose of aromatase inhibitors. There has been one study looking at a lower dose of tamoxifen administered for a shorter interval for three years. However, this was not in a study of women who had invasive breast cancer. It was in the setting of prevention. We sometimes uh, give these same medications, the aromatase inhibitors and tamoxifen to women who are at risk for getting breast cancer who have not had an invasive breast cancer beforehand. And in that setting, this lower dose of tamoxifen uh, was studied and appeared to have some benefit compared to a sugar pill, basically. And there's no data to support that in the setting of a woman who's already had breast cancer, however. So it's not something that I would say is the standard of care for a woman to do. Okay. Are the toxicity profiles of the various drugs, letrozole, exemestane, and anastrozole different or the same? So I think overall, the aromatase inhibitors do have uh, similar toxicity profiles. The most common things um, in my experience that we've seen with those medications is joint discomfort, often a stiffness or uh, ache, often in small joints, usually the same on both sides, and often really worst in the mornings um, before a woman moves around a lot. And then we see the thinning of the bones, um, and we definitely do see some vaginal dryness. Those would be the most common. The hot flashes occur maybe a little bit less frequently in my clinical experience. Um, but as I said, for whatever reason, sometimes people really do prefer one versus another and find the side effects to be more, more bearable for one versus the other. And do we know what percentage of women develop osteopenia or osteoporosis after starting an aromatase inhibitor? So I think overall about 5-10% will develop osteoporosis. Um, we know that there is some acceleration of bone loss, particularly in the first year or so after taking an aromatase inhibitor. Um, fortunately, women who start with a relatively normal bone density are very unlikely to progress to the point that they'll have a fracture during endocrine therapy, but it's not a 0% risk. And that's why we always recommend monitoring the bone density and um, treating uh, if needed and weight bearing exercise is really, really important. Okay. I wanna now uh, cover the topic of fertility and endocrine therapy. We got this, uh, the following question 
uh, submitted. So consider this patient case. Um, the patient is 30 years old and just completed breast cancer surgery. Her doctor recommended that she take tamoxifen now, but she is worried about side effects related to fertility. Is she still, if she still wants to be able to have more children, should she avoid taking endocrine therapy? So this is a, a really important topic, um, the issue of fertility and pregnancies after breast cancer. Um, chemotherapy, we know can impact fertility by um, potentially being toxic to the ovaries, which make the eggs. Um, hormonal therapies such as tamoxifen uh, are not thought to directly impact fertility. However, getting pregnant while taking tamoxifen is something that we want to avoid. And the problem that we run into with hormonal therapy as it relates to fertility is that we give hormonal therapy for five or 10 years and a woman's fertility naturally declines with age. So if you start tamoxifen at 30, for example, and you finish at 40, your likelihood of being able to conceive is much lower, although most women still at 40 might be premenopausal. Um, for this reason, if, if I am seeing a patient who is young and interested in having a baby in the future, I generally recommend having them see a reproductive endocrinologist before they start any therapies at all for breast cancer, any medications. And there are instances in which women will save either eggs or embryos so that on the tail end, if they are not able to conceive, um, they can do so using the assisted reproductive techniques. Uh, the other thing that comes into play sometimes related to fertility is women sometimes wanna take a break from their hormonal therapy because it's going on for five or 10 years and they really wanna have a baby and they don't wanna wait until it's over. Um, and that's also a very tough decision to make. Um, we don't have a lot of high quality data on this. And as you can imagine, that's because we can't, it's hard to study. The way that we get our best data is we do a randomized study and we give half the people one treatment and half the people the other treatment. And you can't say to half the people go get pregnant and to the other half the people don't go get pregnant. So we kind of have to look backwards in general. But the data that we have suggests that People who get pregnant after breast cancer overall do not seem to have a higher chance of the breast cancer coming back. But what, what can make us a little nervous is the idea of um, interrupting the breast cancer therapy and not necessarily, you know, whether or not a woman will come back to it. So there's a really important clinical trial that's going on right now. We don't have the results yet, um, but women who had completed at least a year and a half um, and, and often a bit more of endocrine therapy um, are taking a break to try to conceive and then being encouraged to go back on their endocrine therapy after having a baby. And we are watching this data closely to look at the risk of cancer coming back and to see if it's within a, a very low and acceptable range so that we'll be able to inform people, you know, give them some better data to make this really important decision. Great. Uh, I'm going to take a couple uh, questions and then we'll wrap up, um, even though we have so many questions on the chat. So again, thank you all for your question. We'll follow up offline, but I'm going to try to get a couple before we have to close. Um, consider the following patient case. So the patient is taking tamoxifen and having serious trouble with nausea and bone pain. Is there anything she could do to help with the side effects? She wants to be able to keep taking the drug, but it's affecting her day-to-day -day life. Well, that sounds really tough um, and maybe a little bit uncommon, to be honest. Those are not super common side effects with tamoxifen. So uh, whenever I see slightly uncommon side effects, I always um, talk to have, encourage people to talk to their doctors to make sure there's not something else that could be at play. Um, and then sometimes we will have women take a little break from the hormonal therapy and that sort of lets us see if the side effect will go away. And then we can consider rechallenging with it or trying another substitute. If she's postmenopausal, for example, she could consider an aromatase inhibitor. Or we sometimes will treat the side effects with medications or dietary changes, for example, that may help with nausea or pain medications. Um, but ultimately, it's a discussion about the overall benefits versus the side effects and how we can keep you on it if it's, if it's worth it. But we'd love to keep most women on it as long as possible. Okay. Uh, I want to consider another patient case. A uh, patient has been taking 
tamoxifen for about one year now, but due to bad side effects, she stopped taking the pill every day. Will taking the pill three to four times a week instead of every day really increase the chances of recurrence? So I don't think we have great data on sort of the specifics of three to four times a week versus seven times a week or five to six times a week versus seven times a week. But um, as I alluded to earlier, we, do, we definitely have data that not taking it the way it's prescribed is not good. So I would encourage you to take it as best as possible uh, as prescribed every single day. Uh, so maybe last question, because we've been talking about all the side effects, and I see a comment on the chat saying, from a person saying, I haven't started on these yet. It sounds like a horror show, sorry to say. Uh, but how many people, does everybody have side effects? Are people, some people don't have them? Just help us a bit, kind of, you know, I don't want to buy yeah, it. I, I don't think it's a horror show at all. Um, yeah. I think uh, there is definitely a range and many people experience no side effects. Many experience very mild side effects that are very real, but very tolerable and they can find workarounds in their lives. Um, there are some women, unfortunately, who, who do experience a lot of side effects. Um, but, and fortunately, they typically go away if you stop the medication or try something else. But I don't think it's a, a horror show. And I really want to emphasize that everyone is different and that many people are really tolerating it quite well. Yeah, and I do want to say that because we see it and I see actually a few people that also are sharing on the chat that they're doing well. Um, we have more questions, but unfortunately we have to wrap up. We're coming to the end of this. So first of all, thank you, Dr. Smith, for taking the time for, to join us today. Thank you all for being with us today and taking the time. If you have any follow-up questions, and again, also, you know, if we didn't get to your questions on, uh, uh, on, on the chat, please either submit your questions via the app, via the ask button, or uh, send us an email at questions at outcomesforme.com, including, you know, what topics you'd like us to cover in the future. Uh, we will also be making this video available on our app along with the blog recap of you if you want to revisit and share with others. And then lastly, please make sure to so that you don't miss any future updates from us to download the app and enable push notifications. Thanks again. Thank you for everyone. And thank you, Dr. Smith, for taking for being with us today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.